Nick Hornbuckle, welcome to TwoFingerBanjo.com. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, Matt, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really happy that you have a, a website that's, that's devoted to two-finger banjo playing. It's about time, I think. Yeah, well, I, I have to say that having you as our first guest, I have a, a list of interview subjects that I want to subject to this, but having you as the first of several, if not many, seems fitting given that I truly think that you're probably the most recognizable two-finger banjo player on the planet in terms of touring with the John Reichman and the Jaybirds and your solo albums and the tab that's available on your website and your YouTube channel and your Instagram. I feel like you're kind of at the forefront and, and even if people don't know they're hearing two-finger banjo from you, more people are hearing two-finger banjo playing from you than anyone else. So you're, you're really the best person to kick off my interview series with. So, well, I, you know what, I really appreciate that. And, uh, those are some very kind words. I really, you know, I just, yeah, you know, I didn't set out to be a two finger banjo player and this is just kind of the, how things have developed. And I'm, I'm very happy with what's how it's going. So anyway, thanks very much for having me be your inaugural interview. I, I, I hope to, it doesn't ruin it for everybody else. Oh, it couldn't. Um, I just want to jump right in with something you already said in terms of how you got to playing two finger banjo. Can you explain to people why you play this style in particular? Well, um, I started playing the banjo when I was about 12 and uh, I can't remember. I grew up in the Puget Sound area, Washington state. And uh, no one in the family played banjos or bluegrass or any of that stuff. And it just, a neighbor up the road had a banjo and I found it and that was it. And uh, somehow I learned about Earl Scruggs, who Earl Scruggs was. I mean, this is back when you would go to the library and look through library cards, right? It wasn't like just, and uh, anyway, so I found out who Earl Scruggs was and he just absolutely knocked me out. I mean, um, just his timing and his tone and just exquisitely tasteful player and very compelling. And I just had to figure out how this guy was making that sound because it was just so drew me in. So anyway, so uh, I, I figure out how to play with three fingers. I took lessons for a couple months with a guy in town, but then he left under mysterious circumstances and uh, I was on my own. And um I had a, a record player that would go from 33 down to 16, a Flatten Scruggs Greatest Hits record, it was a reissue, and a picture of Earl Scruggs, that's what I had. <laughs> um, and uh, so anyway, so I played three finger for many years. Uh, when I finally graduated from high school, I went to school uh, in Bellingham, Washington, and uh, I put my banjo down at that point because I couldn't find any bluegrass players in Bellingham, which is just super lame because it turns out Bellingham at that point was just rotten with really great. Like, I think Peter Schwimmer lived up there for a while. I mean, just super uh, talented players. Tony Trishka would go up there and, you know, I was just on campus. I didn't know the town. And anyway, so I, I had started playing electric bass a couple years before, so I just played bass for the next uh, 14 years or so. And then I picked up my banjo again. And, uh, when I started playing again, I had like some, some pain in my, in this part of my wrist, you know, it wasn't a big deal, but it just like, when I was a kid, it was just effortless. I just played for hours fast. and didn't you know, nothing. But then when I picked it up again, uh, I was experiencing a little bit of pain in my wrist, but you know, that's, that's not the problem. It, 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 so as, as time went along, uh, I kind of got my playing back together and I uh, played in a couple of local bands in Seattle. And then, uh, I was asked to teach at a music camp in on Vashon Island, which is in the Puget Sound, just off the, you know, it's between, uh, Seattle and like, um, 
Bremerton, maybe. And uh, one of the teachers there was this guy named John Reichman. And uh, I'd never heard of John, which is really kind of amazing. But I could tell by the way that the other instructors treated him that he was somebody. Then he gets his mandolin out, starts playing. I'm like, I had never heard. I had never heard. I had never heard anybody play like that. And I'd been around what I thought were some pretty good players in Seattle. Nothing like that. Just like, holy man, this is amazing. So over the course of the week, I'm kind of going tangential on you. Oh, well. Over the course of the week, we played a lot together. And then the the week ended and I said, okay, see you later. And then eventually I got a call from a friend of his who invited me up to a Christmas party. And I was like, yeah, in, in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I was like, hey, I, I, I don't think my car is going to make it. And uh, this friend Jim said, well, I'm not supposed to say anything, but John wants to hire you to be the banjo player in a tribute to Bill Monroe. He's putting together because Monroe had just passed away. Oh, wow. Uh, let me get a, let me get a pen, a piece of paper. What's your address? You know? So then I went up there and got hired for that band, which was really great. And then John and I played in like two or three bands together before, before the Jaybirds. So anyway, all that time I was just playing a lot, playing a lot, playing a lot, playing a lot. Um, and then in about, like 1999 or so, maybe a couple years earlier, I started to notice that this finger, my, my middle finger, just kind of felt funny. Like it, it wasn't doing weird, you know, sometimes people have these mechanical issues where it curls up or it extends or just it doesn't, it just didn't feel right. Like it felt kind of nervy, if that makes any sense. So I went and had tests done and they basically told me that I was making it up, which was, that's super helpful. Um, and, uh, the time went along and then uh, we moved to Vancouver Island in 2005. And, uh, you know, the idea being that I would become a full-time professional musician, that Jaybirds were working a lot. I was going to teach and, you know, good on you. And it just started getting worse and worse. And I was thinking, oh, this is great. So anyway, long story short. So one day I was standing in my living room playing along with Flatten Scruggs and uh, trying to find ways to solve this problem because I could really hear it. I could really hear that it was not right. And, but no one else was saying anything. So it was kind of like this weird situation and then they, they may not have heard it. I don't know. <clears throat> so anyway, so I stand in there and, uh, I was playing along with fireball and mail and just out of complete and utter frustration started playing the roles with two fingers instead of three. And it was just like instantly there. I mean, it was, I look back at that now and it was super weird because you would think that having these intricate right hand patterns played tens of thousands of times would create these really deep neural pathways. And just to instantly go from that to something that's close, but not the same, but not, but almost too close it would be like really confusing you know what i'm saying and it just to have it happen like that was just really weird i mean here just let me i'm in a different tuning but let me just play something really quick So I, that's not exactly like Earl. And if, when I sit down and practice with Earl, I can get it pretty close. Yeah. But it it's just, I'm substituting thumbs in the three finger roll. So anyway, what was the question? You asked how I got to this. Yeah. And you got there. So, uh, um, when it first happened, it was really, um, it really kind of freaked me out because, you know, I just had, had identified as being a three-finger bluegrass player. 
And to go from that to being all of a sudden a two finger player, just like, oh man. And so for several months afterwards, I would still wear a pick on this finger and it would just kind of rest on the head. I mean, one time we're playing at the romp down on the, on the river in uh, Kentucky. Owensboro, right? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we're, the, the, this is with the Jaybirds and we were standing in this field warming up, get ready to go play on the stage. And our bass player, Trisha kind of, we got done. She kind of looked down at, at my hand and said, why do you have a pick on that finger? I mean, she's just completely innocent question, not knowing all this turmoil I've been going through for months, just like, and I, and I just, I looked at her, I said, I really don't know. I don't know. I'm hoping that it comes back and it never did. Wow. Yeah. And so then after, after, at that point, I just took it off. Like, well, well, what's the point? You know, I am what I am. That's what I can do. And uh, every once in a while, I'll put the third pick on and I'll try to play. And it's just, it's terrible really bad and it's just it's makes me feel uncomfortable and you know i've developed the way that i play to such an extent that it's just it's pretty pretty natural feeling at this point you know so anyway, yeah super well, long answer to a very simple question <laughs> well i knew you had a story about it though and i think i think there are folks who are going to stumble across this website and my videos teaching two finger and yours teaching two finger who will be heartened to know that if claw hammer doesn't work for them or if scrug style with three fingers doesn't work for them, that there is still a way to play the banjo. Um, Absolutely. So. You know, I, I have been, sorry, I can't handle not being in tune. Um, I have been in situations around players that I've, you know, really respected specifically at music camps. And as an example, a student will, show up to one of the classes and we'll have, you know, some, some kind of an issue with their hands or something. And this one instructor who I'm not going to name, but was very adamant saying, unless you do it this way, you will never play the banjo. And I remember sitting there going, what? This is before I went to three fingers. Even at that point, I was thinking, what? It's a musical instrument. Play it any way you want to. What? Just because Earl Scruggs did it that way doesn't mean everybody... If everybody did it that way, it'd be terrible. <laughs> but, Agreed. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, people once in a while will reach out to me and want to know more about what it is I'm doing. And I'm happy to, to share whatever I can, you know. Um, but one of the things that I do say is that if, if a person is really interested in playing like real traditional bluegrass banjo playing, in the style that Earl Scruggs plays in, you should really give it your best shot to play with three fingers because there's just a certain uh, thing that you get with that particular right hand technique that's very difficult to get in, in you know, a different way. The, the way that I play in a bluegrass band is kind of, it's informed by Earl Scruggs, but it's, it's not really a Scruggs style. Right. It's hornbuckle style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse. But, uh, you know, it's, it's now, I mean, I don't know if we should mention it, but we're in the, this is the, the, the winter of 2020 and we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And so as a result of that, all touring has been stopped for the last, what, 10 months, nine months. And uh, anyway, when I used to play live, uh, once in a while, people would come up to the record table during the break and they'd be interested about my banjo or they liked the way I played or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times when I told them that I played with two fingers, they're just their heads would explode. It was just. And, and then when I told them I played a banjo that didn't have a tone ring in it, it's just like they're on to some other plane of existence <laughs> they probably think you're a sorcerer or something Ooh, yeah <laughs> something <laughs> what i want to know is if you t if you've told your boss john reichman that you're only playing with two fingers and if you haven't yet don't because he's paying you more per finger now than he was originally <laughs> <laughs> you know uh john is a super cool guy he's, a, he's one of my best friends and uh when this 
whole thing started to manifest itself in a way that I had to do something. He was incredibly supportive. You know, I, I remember before I went to the two fingers, I would sit, I would grab people who I respected and play for them and say, are you hearing it? And every one of them would say, no, I just think man, you're just deaf. But when I went to two, I remember we were on the ferry somewhere, going somewhere here. And, uh, he, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like, man, this, you know, this is really cool. You're here. You are this guy that plays with two fingers on a banjo with no tone ring. I mean, no one's doing that. And he said, and you sound great doing it. I was like, well, thanks. That's great. So he's been very supportive. You have such a great sound. Um, and there is nothing wrong with being the only one doing something, especially when you do it so well. <laughs> so with that in mind, I wonder, would you be up for playing us a tune before we chat some more? Absolutely. I was thinking about that. I'll play you uh, a tune that, um... sorry, I just, I, I went into a different tuning to a, a pro do my lame approximation of Earl Scruggs. And... This is a tune that I learned off of a, a, a record by this really great banjo player and fiddler. I think he lives in North Carolina named Kirk Sutton. Is, is he in North Carolina? Yeah, he's in Walkertown, North Carolina, last I checked. Really, just really, really amazingly great player. And um, the name of the tune is the Virginia Reel. And this is the first tune that I tried to figure out this is back when I was playing with three fingers, but I was had been starting to get interest. This is like, you know, uh, uh, early 2000. I was starting to get interested in these different tunings. Because most bluegrass banjo players use open G, a slightly modified C tuning, which is dropping that low D down to a C, or they'll use, uh, you know, the, the open D tuning that Earl used on Rubin which are three great tunings, but in claw hammer banjo, there's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's basically endless how many tunings there are. It's really cool. And one of the reasons that I got interested in the tunings is that, you know, especially this double C is that Earl never recorded or played in this tuning. So it's wide open. You know, there's, there's no, he hadn't blazed a trail in this tuning yet. I mean, it's all the same 12 notes. But it sounds different with, uh, you know, this this D chord. It's in tune. Sounds different than a D chord in open G with stopping all the strings, right? So this is the first tune that I sat down and really tried to figure out in a way that wasn't the way that Earl plays fiddle tunes, which is really, I mean, his uh, arrangement of Sally Gooden is just like, man, it's the best, but it's not really the way the fiddle plays it. And I didn't want to try to figure it out the way that someone like Bill Keith would, because I just, you know, I'm okay at math, but I'm not that good. And that stuff, that way of playing is just so cerebral to me. I just, man, I got straw in my head. I just can't keep that stuff straight because it's all, you know, you play a lower string to get a higher note. It's just like, what? It's like he did that on purpose. To, it was like a like an IQ test. If you, Can you figure this out? If you can't, well, we know where you belong. Um, so, so anyway, so I tried to figure out this tune in this double C tuning capoed at the second fret because it's in the key of D. And um, instead of picking every note, because I had seen claw hammer players play it, not up close, but I'd kind of seen them. And it seemed to me that they were getting a lot of notes out of the left hand like they weren't picking each note like bluegrass banjo players want to pick every note and it's just uh, it drives me crazy it people that can really do it it's really impressive but but anyway so the the claw hammer players would get a lot of stuff out of the left hand and i thought that's really cool it's a very it's a very subtle sound it's not every note being exactly the same amplitude and velocity and duration and everything like bluegrass players want to do it was more I don't know, organic, funky sounding, you know, just more interesting to me. Um, so I tried to figure out. So I, I figured out this tune using that tuning and some of these hammer on and pull off techniques that I had seen claw hammer players use. So. Um, 
Um, that is, it's cool that you played that first for us because that's actually the first tune of yours that I was really aware of in terms of an arrangement. And I, when I was in Chicago teaching at the Old Town School of Folk Music, I used your tab. I got a hold of your tab, maybe directly from you or by, from your website, and I taught it to some of my classes. And I have a few students. This one student, um, Tim. Stevens, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm mentioning him by name, who lives in Evanston, Illinois. Um, and he worked he worked so hard to learn this and he plays it beautifully. And he just really took to your arrangement. I know other people did, but he continued in some private lessons for a while. And he would often pull this out and spend a lot of time um, really diving in, delving into your, your arrangement, which I grew up listening to that Kirk Sutphin record that, you're, that you pulled it off of, um, Old Roots and New Branches. And the new five cent piece that's on there is like one of my all time favorite D tunes on the fiddle as a fiddle player. Um, and I got to know Kirk and visit him and play with him and learn from him a bit. So I love that, that one of the connections that you and I have is a mutual admiration for that tune, uh, new five cent piece and that whole record. And, um, it was fun to, to, sh to bring one of your arrangements to, to some Chicago folks, um, a bunch of years ago, it's been maybe three or four years now. So, yeah. That's great. You know, it's uh, it's one of the things that's interesting to me, and probably only interesting to me, is it with with it, as an example with that tune. I sat down and I'm. It was after we bought our first house in Seattle, it was like, which is when two thousand. So I remember sitting in the office there, maybe two thousand one, really starting to work on this tune. And at that point, you know, it took me a long time to figure it out. Cause it was just a different tuning, just all this stuff. And then finally I put together an arrangement that I thought, yeah, I nailed it, man. That's it. That's it. And then as time went along, I would check back in and realize that I didn't quite have it. I didn't quite have, it, it wasn't quite right. I think that we talked about this with uh, that tune 90 degrees. Yeah. But uh, so with this arrangement that I just played, I mean, up to this moment, this is as accurate to what the fiddles play on that CD as I can make it. And I'm sure that five years from now, I'll go back and listen and go, oh, well, that's not quite right. But that's that's uh, one of my goals when I'm creating these arrangements of these fiddle tunes is that I want to, I really want to try to play exactly what the fiddle's playing. There are certain situations where it's, it's just... Um, it's either not possible or it's just super hard to do. And so I have to change something. But uh, I think that it's that, you know, as time is going along, excuse me, and I'm doing this more and more and transcribing more and more fiddle tunes, I, I'm, I'm observing that my ear is getting better and able to pick out these little subtleties that, you know, five, 10 years ago, I just would, I just didn't hear them. Yeah. Well, it, it sounds like you've got it to me. And I, I know that experience of learning the tune faithfully and then playing it for a while and then going back to the recording and realizing there's another like 10% or 15% that I didn't get the first time or the third time. Um, but I Which do want to... It's like the key 10%. It's not like, you know, no. <laughs> not like just like a couple of notes somewhere off in the weeds. It's like, that's, that's the most important thing. I, for me anyway, it's like, oh, Exactly. A C natural. Okay. Instead of a B. Oh, okay. Well that changes everything. It changes everything. I yeah. totally agree. Um, and I've had that happen with so many fiddle tunes on the fiddle. Uh, yeah. I'm glad you share that experience. Um, I have a couple 
couple questions get, that are going to get more and more specific, but I do want you to just describe for us, what is your current process? We're recording in the fall of 2020. What is your current process for like, you've identified a fiddle tune, you're going to make the closest match you can on the banjo in the two finger style. What tools in terms of like software, slowing things down, using repeating loops, like how do you go about tr- making one of your arrangements? Cause I'm fascinated. Absolutely. It's, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, well, it's interesting to me is that one of the tools that I've found that's been absolutely invaluable on my iPhone and on my Android is this thing called the amazing slow downer. I use it as well. Yeah. And it's a, it's a super powerful little piece of software because I mentioned earlier in our conversation about when I was first learning how to play my audio example to listen to, to, to learn was a, a vinyl LP that rotated at 33 and a third rotations per minute. And I had a little kid's record player that would go down to 16. Well, 16 is not really half a 33 and a third. So you drop that down to half speed and it was flat and scrug. So they were a little bit loose with whether they weren't really in standard tuning. So there's all these factors involved They're trying to get the, and it's an octave lower. So it's, God, painstaking. But with this amazing slow downer, you can slow it down. And the when you get down to like 25%, the there's a little bit of degradation of the audio, especially if you're using an MP3. If you're able to use a WAV file, it's pretty good because it's you know just a lot more information there. Um, so what I do is it uh, I'll troll through YouTube or records or spotify or whatever in fact i've got a list on my phone of the new tunes i want to learn um and i'll find uh, a tune it's just like wow this is really a, really a great tune i love this tune and then i will uh usually what i try to do is try to get try to find as many different versions as i can just to get a because you know uh one person's version may really knock me out but it may be really different than other people's and it's you know that's cool i can do that one thing or i can combine bits and pieces from their arrangements into this one and make my new kind of thing um so anyway so i will find a a tune and i'll listen to it just a bunch without trying to play it just listen and listen so i get a get a, a a visual contour of the melody you know just try to, you know, starts up high, then it goes down low, then it goes a little higher, you know, that kind of thing. So I can kind of, instead of wasting a bunch of time pecking around down here for something that's up here, there's, you know. And then I'll figure out what, what key it's in and what tuning would be best to use. Um, and then just kind of start going phrase by phrase. And... As I'm getting older, I'm really starting to see the wisdom in, uh, years ago, I, I met this, you know, one of the best banjo players on the planet, Jens Kruger, and we were just talking about banjo playing as you do. And uh, we were talking about learning and I'm paraphrasing, of course, but his basic approach is, is to play it through the first time so slowly that he doesn't make a mistake because you want to make sure that all the information going in is good, clean information and not like mostly good. And then there's some mistakes or awkward moves or whatever. I mean, he, and he showed me how slow he would play. And it was just like way slower than you think. It was amazing to watch. It's like, well, here's this guy who's this amazing player and this is what he does. So it's a really good, I, you know, you come across little bits of advice like that. There are from players like that. It's really good to take that advice. So what I'm trying to do when I'm learning these tunes is to learn a phrase at a time and really take my time and figure out how exactly I'm going to play it. Um, so that all the information being put into my brain is consistent every time that I play it, which doesn't mean that it's not open for, um, you know, interpretation or a little bit of improvisation later on, but that's after I learned the tune. When I'm first learning it, I, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to muddy up the waters with a bunch of ifs or in case of, you know, I don't know what the computer code lingo is, but make it very clean. Um, and then uh, 
I will record it on my phone. I'll make a video of it. And it's showing both hands. So so I can, you know, if something comes up and I have to whatever and I can't come back to it for a day or two, I want to have a visual memory of exactly how I was playing. And I play it really slow. So just like I can watch on the video and go, okay, right, I did that. And then I can pick it up and, you know, uh, continue on. Can you show us how slow, like take a phrase of Virginia Reel and just demonstrate, like if, if you were a day in, how slowly would you be playing phrase one? Okay, so uh, what I would do is if, let's see. Super annoying. So the first phrase, and this is, so, I mean, we can just, I mean, I can just totally go down the, the 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 rabbit hole with this stuff because even that first three notes is like well what exactly is he doing there i mean because it sounds i mean what i'm doing is but that's not what he's doing and i know it but i can't i, I think he's doing a double stop but i can't really because there's two fiddles it's hard for me to really tease apart and it kind of sounds to me like especially as a tune gets further in they go to a slight variation and one of the fiddles drops an octave right you know so yep. but so so anyway so that that first phrase i'm doing it as a as a hammer on so it's f sharp g a which is the way a lot of fiddle tunes start you know now what uh, so then the next phrase is So uh, if I was super great at playing like single string style, I might just play it like that. But I can't, it, when I do that style, it just sounds choppy and like not musical at all. There's no, it's not legato. There's no, it's very unpleasant to listen to. So the pitches go, but if I go, I'm having to kill that note. So what I figured, and this took me forever to figure out, and I use this idea all the time, is that instead of going to that first string, fifth fret, I'll hit the fifth string open because that string will ring. Well, it gives me Forever, yeah. This one. So it's... It's not quite in tune, sorry. Right? Um, and I really like using hammer-ons and pull-offs i think that that's a really cool thing because it, it gives the music a certain one of the things that i've noticed about when i listen to earl scruggs play and i'm talking about you know 50s on up the 1950s you know mid 50s and on up not when he was with monroe because with monroe he was the machine gun just incredible stunning in his precision and every note was but one of the things about Earl's playing that just totally knocked me out is that there were these interesting ebb and flow in the volume of the notes. It wasn't just all the same, which when players can get to that degree of control where they can do that, that's really impressive because it that's really hard to do. Especially and it's Andro. Yeah, it's actually something I love about your playing in particular. I hope you don't mind me complimenting you again. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were playing... Virginia Real, I was just reminded of, of what I hear when I hear your recordings and your videos is that with all those hammers and pulls, which are more than I do in my two finger arrangements, um, it creates this beautiful lilt to the music where you're, you have a control over the rhythm that's different than right hand rhythmic control, mm -hmm. because you're able to like, you know, kind of slide rhythmically slide into the next beat or accentuate purely with volume um the end of the you know and one and two and three and and because a lot of those the pull off or the slide or the hammer on often occurs to help us bridge like you know the two halves of of a beat maybe or mm -hmm. to, to subdivide a beat and you you're masterful at how you how you play with that and how you create those contours with volume and maybe with a little bit of like rhythmic wiggling so that it's not like it's, it doesn't sound like a typewriter. It sounds like music. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's. Uh, I really appreciate that 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 those very kind words and and, and that observation because it's de definitely something that I think a lot about. You know, um, I've spent a lot of time playing in the Jaybirds and playing in bluegrass bands, but I also spend a lot of time playing by myself, and the job requirements for those two things are just wildly different in the in a band your job is to make the ensemble sound good always yeah to do what you can do to make whoever's featured at that moment sound their best and sometimes that means not playing which i'm i'm good with that or playing very little you know because it's the sum has to be greater than the parts or else what's the point and that's one of the things, another tangent, that's one of the things I absolutely love about the Jaybirds is that everybody's on that page, which is, it's not the case a lot of times. A lot of times people are just kind of checked out or they're showboating or whatever. But so uh, the job requirement, that sounds kind of harsh, but the requirement for when I'm just playing stuff by myself is that it needs to sound, I would like it to sound complete as it is. In other words, that it doesn't need a rhythm section. Or a fiddle even. Yeah. And uh, so when I'm coming up, coming up with these arrangements, I'm doing it in exactly the way that they will be played, mostly. Unless I'm able to play with a, a, you know, a fiddle or something. But mostly I just play by myself. And so I want them to sound good just by themselves. I don't want to have to have them be reliant on you know, someone changing the chord underneath to make it make sense. It, it, you know, I want it to sound like it should. That's, that's fabulous. And it, it works. It's, it's one of the distinguishing characteristics of your playing, I think. So two, two things come to mind then. One is that I've been asked a couple times by my Patreon supporters or private lesson students, folks are really curious how to play backup with two fingers. And I, I can't think of a better person to ask than you, because like you just said, you work up these fiddle tunes to play alone or maybe with a fiddler when you get a chance. But in the Jaybirds, you're not always playing lead. Could you share a little bit of what you would do when, like either when John's playing a lead or when someone's singing and you don't want to be like stealing the limelight by, by taking the melody at the same time? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll play this, uh, I'm going to, uh, one of the tunes that we do is this uh, I was another tangent I was not severely spanked but spanked enough that it got to mark years ago by a fiddler who said that's a song it's not a tune so it's like I try to use the, the correct word for the correct thing so one of the songs that we do uh, is a tune that we heard on a, oh no, I'm totally blanking on this. Oh, uh, on, a, on a Dirk Powell record. It's called uh, Hop High. Uh, and so we start the song with a, a little sort of instrumental intro of just the banjo and the mandolin playing roustabout, which is the same, apparently it's the same tune. I mean, I'm no, I'm no expert, but that's what I'm told. So, so we would kick it off, you know. Oops, that was bad. And so on and so forth. So then it kicks into a bluegrass version. So the, the, the last little bit of the tune is. And I go.
and so on and so forth. That is so, so cool. Thank you. It's uh, well, what I'm trying to do is just trying to play a groove, and I mean, it probably sounds yeah. terrible, but trying to play a uh, a groove that 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 sounds bluegrassy, but it's really not because I'm you know I'm, the roles I'm playing aren't exactly correct, but and then uh, you know uh, in a bluegrass band, as far as I understand it, the, one of the fundamental jobs of the five string banjo is to provide this stream of eighth notes. It's like a hi-hat. Um, and to not be super distracting, which some people just haven't got that memo. I, I don't get it, but whatever. And so I'm trying to provide this stream of eighth notes and stay out of the way of our fiddle player, Greg, and not get down too low where the guitar is, kind of stay somewhere in the middle um but uh one of the techniques that i found and it's really kind of interesting because up until fairly recently i thought that i was the only person that did this i mean you know i live under a rock so of course i would think that you live on an island not under a rock <laughs> I, I live on a rock <laughs> um but it's, it's this idea of of doing these uh hammer-ons as a as a as a rhythmic pattern as a, as a, as a backup thing, you know, cause if you were to play that song with, you know, three finger roll patterns, well, that's fine. I'm not necessarily warmed up now. And if I was out playing on the road, I could probably do that at the tempo it needed to be, but you know, there's this other solution, which is using these, using a, a hammer on kind of thing. And it sort of mimics to the best of my ability that, you know, bum ditty that, that, that you get on the, on the uh, claw hammer style. Totally. That's very convincing. And uh, you can actually take that and, uh, uh, and just really go to town with it. And, and, and I have found, uh, to my satisfaction that I really like this approach. So it's like um, going up and playing that, that uh, uh, this is in the key of B, sort of B, I don't know what it is, B squared, I don't know. So you would go up to the, uh, what's that, the 16th fret and then hammer on the third string, fret the first string at 16th fret, hammer on third string. <laughs> And that kind of uh, that kind of idea, you know, you know, whatever. So that kind of idea of using those hammer-ons to get that pulse going is, I think, I, well, I like it. And apparently most, if not all, the Jaybirds like it. So that's kind of what counts. <laughs> yeah, I like it too. So that's that's a, I think we've got a quorum. Yeah, and, well, and it's, and it's so easy to do. I mean, it's easy. I shouldn't say that. It's the idea, the, 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 the fundamental idea behind it is very easy. It's just a hammer on and I'm going. So it's hammer on four, five, one, then three, then five, one. I love it. And that's, that's the kind of thing that in the very beginnings of, of the two finger banjo.com teaching, I have a, a short YouTube video of picking patterns. And one of them is just to go like three, five, one, three, five, one. And if you just add a hammer in front of that yeah. hammer, five, one, three, five, one, that's, that's the pattern you're talking about. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, I have showed that to a lot of people and some people just grab it immediately and other people have a harder time. I mean, it's like anything else. It's not that big a deal, but I think that one of the things is, is that 
if people are really locked into, say, for instance, the forward roll, you know, the, the thumb index middle, they're trying to shove this idea like a square peg into a round hole. Like it's not going to, it's not going to work. But, you know, if someone wanted to learn it, once you got the groove of it, how it, how it goes, well, then you can do it. You have to do it this way, do it some other way. It doesn't matter. Totally. Totally. Whatever it sounds good. Yeah. And, and it sounds, it, it, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thing because in the Scrug style backup, it's these uh, repeating uh, arpeggios. Uh, and, you know, the, just tangentially that those those roles are really cool and it's to me i see a lot of banjo instruction where a forward roll is tabbed out in an eight note measure thumb index middle thumb index middle thumb index thumb index middle thumb index middle you know like it's an yep. eight note unit yep eight note unit yeah the way that i like to think of it is a forward roll is thumb index middle and then you just cut and paste Exactly. As you can. And one of the things that that does, if you can do that, it's really kind of weird. This is a little esoteric is that, you know, the, the, the banjo, the one that we play anyways, comes from, uh, West Africa, right? I mean, the, the ancestor came from West Africa. And if you've ever listened to African music, it is just intoxicating. It is just amazingly polyrhythmic. And if you can have, a standard two four beat and yet have these clusters of three going against that it's really magical it's really cool and a lot of people don't do that because they want to play their licks but one of my favorite things to do is just play that you know against a if you can hear this Kind of accentuating that that third string, but yeah, da 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 yeah. da da. It's like it's it's like music from you know, it's really cool. So there's in a bluegrass band, that's kind of what you're supposed to do. But this kind of thing is really kind of nailing down that downbeat, you know, making it just like this is anyway. Because the hammer, the hammer's on the down. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. And, I love it. And, and and you can, you know, you can do all kinds of rhythmic variations around that, that just whatever comes into your head. And that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing. I mean, I love playing with the band, but one of the things I love doing when I'm playing with the Jaybirds is just kind of playing rhythm backup. I absolutely love that because, you know, Patrick Sauber, amazing banjo player, phenomenal guitar player, great singer, mandolin player. He can do it all. He's got him and Trisha and John. That's what a great rhythm section. They've got the groove happening. So I don't have to worry about that. I can just do my little weird, you know, West African <laughs> banjo stuff. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, oh, man. So good. I want to ask specifically about your right hand, because when I start people in the two finger style, the way I do it, I have a golden rule that keeps, keeps it easy to, to get into it. And then we break the golden rule in the more advanced level. So my golden rule sourced from uh, learning organically off of Paul Brown, he and I never sat down and I never interviewed him about how he does it, but I asked Paul, um, to play banjo a lot in my presence and I got to play fiddle or guitar while he did. And so I created a golden rule where the index finger only plucks the first string and the thumb plucks five, four, and three, and two. And that's a great way to get started. And we have simple tunes that do that and, and more intermediate tunes. And then in the advanced level, I throw it all out the window. Um, do you, if you have to tell someone what you're doing with your right hand, it looks to me like there aren't, there isn't one particular rule. Am I right about that? Yes, you're absolutely right. It's something that, see, it's a really interesting question because when I first started playing with two fingers, I, at that point, I probably started going on the banjo hangout and became more aware of, well, I knew who Will Keys was because I'd seen yeah. him play on the, 
I think he played on the Masters of the Banjo tour back in the 90s. And Kirk Sutphin was on that tour too. Was there too. That's how I heard about yeah. that for sure. Yeah. Um, so I knew that there were two finger players out there, but I was really into Earl Scruggs and I'm not going to do that, that with, the, you know. But um, so when I went to two fingers, I started to explore a little bit more and I realized that that my approach is just extremely idiosyncratic. It's not, um, I'm thinking more of like the notes and the groove and then how I can play those notes and groove that I want to get. And I'm not too worried about maintaining a consistent right hand pattern, which is just, I mean, if you watch me play, it's just like, it's, it's a dog's breakfast. It's all over the place, but it's, it's something that is, is easy. It's the easiest thing. It's the easiest way for me to do, to get the notes and the groove that I'm trying to get. Totally. So, uh, with that said, I I do I suspect, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I suspect that in like uh, traditional two finger playing, there are definite like patterns that people play. Like you know, in claw hammer, which I'm a horrible claw hammer player, there's certain things that you do, and then people go beyond that, of course. But um, um, where is I going with that? Uh, in the way that I play, I, I've, I've, I've discovered that I have a remarkably agile thumb. I had no idea until I had to go to two fingers. Um, and so the, my thumb will play all five and uh, the index will play the top four. It won't play the fifth string. Wow. Because that's just a little. That's, yeah, that's a stretch. That's well, it's just that's just. That's just chewing the scenery. That's just showing off and doing that. That's not. Um, and so, getting back to what I was saying earlier, is that these arrangements are created, just me sitting here in my studio, my bedroom, and coming coming up with something. And so I'm really paying attention to the tone, the timbre of the notes, like the individual notes. And there's a definite difference between. And, you know, granted plastic and metal, but there's a definite difference in, in the tone there. And so I, I really, if I come up with this, a way of playing a sequ sequence of notes and realize that, well, that, that just won't work because the, the, the tones don't, don't work together, then I'll have to change something. I might have to do a pull off or, you know, double, double up on the thumb, like whatever. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, tr I'm really, really trying to pay attention to the noise that comes out the front, you know, what it sounds like and not just making sure that it's uh, technically accurate. And that makes sense. Yeah. And a, I mean, a big difference too, is that though I started playing two finger banjo 20 years ago, um, I spent seven years, seven and a half years teaching it at like, and that was how I paid my rent was mostly by teaching two finger banjo to rooms full of middle-class Chicagoans. Nice. And so I had to think about like, what, you know, what rule could we have or like what? Absolutely. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's couldn't be more different than, I mean, that I totally get it. I've done a, my fair amount of teaching and you have to make it so that it's, that it is uh, easily, the information is easily transmitted and is received in such a way that it makes sense. It can't be this esoteric, well, how do you feel today? It's just like, no, that does, that does not help. <laughs> That's not helpful in the least. You want, tell me where to put my finger. I mean, I totally get that. There's, there's a lot to be said for that, especially when you're just getting started. Right. And it provides, you know, that method of, of, of instruction provides an incredibly sturdy framework that you can hang other things off of it. You know, it's like you, you see people who want to become musicians and instead of like, I'm not saying you have to do this, but it's a really good idea. Instead of having a master that they learn from, however their method is, they do it. They just go, well, I'm just going to start making it up. And it, it's horrible. There's, it's just not musical. And, you know, I mean, not, it's a blanket statement. So by the definition, it's stupid, but generally speaking, it's good to have, you know, a framework to work within. And then once you get to a point where that framework no longer can uh, support the ideas that you have, then you can open up 
that framework exactly or more as 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 time goes along exactly um how how much of the time and this includes jaybirds gigs rehearsals um and then you and your studio working up a tune recording because i know you, you record in your home studio um what percentage of the time do you have your picks on? Because I did see a video of you playing with no picks, but is it 99% of the time that you're playing with picks or 80 or what, how would you? Well, that's a really good question because, you know, back to the timbre issue, there's just such a different tone that you get with without picks. And uh, it's, a, there's a cut on my record um, that's done without picks. And it's just, it's really appealing to me because it's very, um, I find it to be very, um, what's the word? It's very present. Like it's very organic. It's like, it's right there. There's no, there's nothing between your brain. It's just, you know, you, you are actually touching the string, not a pick, which is fine. Uh, so, um, it depends if, if I feel like, you know, I'm irritating my neighbors, then I'll just play without picks. Or sometimes I'll just sit down and pick up my banjo late at night and I don't want to wake up my daughter. And so, especially if I have a, you know, like a, a fragment of a melody comes into my mind or something and I'll just play it without picks. And the interesting thing about that is that if I develop that idea without picks, then it, it making that jump to using picks is challenging because it doesn't sound the same anymore. The timbre is different. And so totally. Like, well, this doesn't sound as good as it did without picks. And then I'm kind of like, well, yeah, but I want to play this with a band. I can't really play with a band without picks. As you know, that's not going to work. <laughs> so uh, I probably, I don't know, twenty percent. Twenty percent without. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and it just it 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 varies. So you mentioned your record. I have it right here. It's lovely. Oh, thank you. Thirteen or so. We've been driving around Colorado, my wife and my son and I, listening to this for the past two and a half weeks. Um, I love it, especially track four, Hopping Harvey. That's my favorite, which is about your about a cat, right? Yes. <laughs> Harvey the cat. Yes, Harvey the cat is a very interesting little creature. He's a uh, he's like the he's the he's the platonic ideal of a cat. <laughs> sense it he's a, he's the he's the platonic ideal of a cat in the sense that it's all about him all the time and it's super charming in its in his abilities just to go i am gonna have nothing to do with you but you could feed me you know? yeah and that's the thing that i really like about cats is it they'll just do their thing and if it just so happens that they need something from you they'll come and let you know like when i get done here i'll walk down the stairs and he'll come up at the bottom of the stairs because we have this grooming station set up and he'll want to be groomed you know and then fed and then he'll be like yep i'm not gonna see you the rest of the night so it's just like well okay cool but anyway so he he does this thing when he plays with my daughter where he'll just and you've seen footage of these big cats where they just leap vertically into the air i mean it's and it's the funniest damn thing and uh uh i wrote that tune in double c tuning uh, I really love double C2 because it's it's super cool. And if folks haven't, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure where to where to pitch this, but if if folks haven't tried that tuning, it really you need to start looking into it because it's super cool, especially in my opinion if you're playing fiddle tunes. Well, for actually, if 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 you want to play fiddle tunes like the way I do, because I couldn't do it, in, I couldn't do what I'm doing. In standard G tuning, it just wouldn't sound the same. Yeah. Well, those who are discovering this interview on twofingerbanjo.com rather than YouTube or my Patreon account, the whole intermediate level is based on playing in double C tuning, um, but with the capo, the second fret for fiddle tunes in D. So 
if they're coming to it this way, they'll, uh, they'll be very familiar with it. And I think delighted to try and learn some of your arrangements here as well. You know, uh, well, that's, yeah. So, uh, when it comes to the tunes on that record, um, I have like, I, I haven't even, I did, who knows how many now I've got easily 80 tunes just in various on phones, on hard drives, you know, if fragments or whole tunes are not fully recorded yet, but you know, there's an A and a B or an A and a B and a C or whatever. There's, it's a tune. And uh, one of the things that I found and one of the things that quite frankly, I miss about touring is that when I was out touring, I would be, especially playing at festivals, you're listening to music all the time at the festival. And I can't tell you how many times I would be back at the hotel and wake up in the middle of the night with the tune in my head. And I would think, okay, so who played this? Oh, oh, this is, this is a, this is an, I got to get my banjo on my phone. I got it. You know, this is something new. I got to catch this right now. That's happened so many times. Um, so anyway, how that relates is that hopping Harvey, uh, was undoubtedly um, inspired by all of these um, transcriptions I've done of fiddle tunes because it's it's kind of a fiddle tuny kind of sounding thing, you know. It doesn't sound like a Scruggs tune. Um, let's see if I can remember how it goes. I was... And one of the things that I like about fiddle tunes is that a lot of times only because I'm not that sophisticated of a listener. It seemed like to me a lot of times uh, in a fiddle tune that has an A and a B, we'll say a lot of times the A is like, wow, that's interesting. The B is like, oh, well, that's the B from, you know. Stolen from another tune. Or something, right? Yeah. So in this tune, um, it's not stolen verbatim. God, no, I wouldn't do that because I have copyrighted this tune. But it's... it's uh, it's informed, shall we say, by, uh, and you, you may not even hear it, but, but uh, by this tune called um, The Chinese Breakdown, I think it's called. Oh, yeah. The New Lost City Ramblers recorded a famous version of that. That tune. So this, the B part of Harvey is not like that at all, but it's, because I've been playing that tune, it, you know, sort of like, oh, I could do this. So anyway, so the tune goes like this. so much yeah the record 13 or so uh it's available on nick's website and i'll include a link to that site uh, on the description of the youtube video but that tune you were talking about you know a good band is is um you know the is better than 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 all its in individual pieces and i feel like that tune also counts like 
it's a great a part it's a great b part but when they're put together it's just like even better yeah, um thank you. whole is better than some of the parts by orders of magnitude it's glorious well, um it's got, you know it's got john playing mandolin on it it's just you know the guy's a master he's really elevated the whole thing just by having him play on it it's really yeah really great it's a great duet it's it's beautiful the whole record is top to bottom and i think getting back to my initial excitement and and uh pervading excitement about having you on this uh visit us this way is that as far as i know you're the only two finger banjo player in, mo in the modern era who is putting out a record like this where you're the you're the front man as a two finger banjo player like there there's there are tracks with smaller ensembles, but then there are tracks with a full band and different people taking solos. And Nick Hornbuckle, the two finger banjo player is the band leader of this lovely project. And I, for a banjo style that hasn't had, you know, Steve Martin hasn't played it on a late night television show yet. And so two finger is still like so cool that no one's ever heard of it. Um, you're, you're the guy who's kind of pushing it a little closer to the, to the edge of you know of popularity and awareness but it's gonna it's gonna explode at some point but yeah that's that's the very interesting insight there i'm i, I uh um years ago uh i was interviewed by pete wernick for banjo newsletter and pete's a great guy he's an amazing banjo player and just a huge you know positive influence in the bluegrass community and the bluegrass music business you know he's just he's really He's a, he's a, he's a powerful guy. And, uh, I had met him through John back when I still play with three fingers. And, um, I think that Donald Nietzsche at Banjo Newsletter, I, I don't remember the exact sequence of events, but anyways, I was asked or approached to be interviewed by Banjo Newsletter. And it was, I had lined up one interviewer, but it didn't work out. And so, um, I think I emailed Pete and I said, Hey, I've got, you know, these guys want to interview from me. Would you consider? And he said, yeah, absolutely. And this was right about the time that I went to two fingers. And so a couple of days before the interview, which we did on the phone, I felt like I needed to come clean. And I sent him an email. I said, Pete, you know, I, I really feel like I want to let you know before we do the interview that I've gone to using two fingers and, uh, just, you know, just FYI. So I, I get this email back and he's like, why, why would you do that? You're a great three finger player. Is it just not challenging enough to you anymore? And, uh, I sent him back an email said, man, you know, no, it's not that at all. I can't play with three fingers anymore. And he was just like, you know, devastated like oh my dude i'm so sorry i had no you know because i it's not something you talk about if you're a professional musician or you know whatever you don't go out and broadcast your issues because it's not good and so that one of the things that he mentioned in that interview is he said you know what you're playing i could never i would never have known that you were doing with two fingers and he said one of the things that that you will find moving forward is you know you've you've you're starting to to develop this really interesting sound and style and you're writing tunes and all that but that people will focus more on the fact that you're playing with two fingers than they will on the fact that the, that the material what the material is like you know and at the time i was just thinking well I'm, I'm happy to get any sort of you know attention or validation or whatever but it's been interesting to kind of see as time has gone along is that some parts or some demographics are really focused on the two finger thing and others are it just they just it doesn't even they have no idea and they're more interested like in particular with this record they're more interested in well are the tunes good does it sound good and the the, the technical aspect of it they're just couldn't be less interested. Right. It's good music. That's what matters the most. Yeah. Thank you. So, so I'm, um, you know, I mean, it's a really interesting thing is that one of the tunes that, that's on the record that I love to death because I wrote for my daughter, Cleo, 
the Jaybirds have been playing this tune for, I mean, this is 2020. We've been playing this tune for 10 years and uh, maybe eight years. I don't know, whatever. And, uh, you know, to us, it's like, it's almost a cover tune because we played it so much. I mean, every time we play it, it's great because they're such great musicians and, you know, they bring it all to the, to the stage. But I have to remember that there are literally billions of people out there that have never heard it. And so I, anyway, where was I going with that? I have to remember that it is important to not just imagine that since, oh yeah, this is all old hat to me. I, all this blah, blah, blah. Is, to other people, it's like, what, what in God's name, what are you doing? <laughs> It's a whole new thing. So I have to try to remember that it's just because it's something that I've done for a long time. That doesn't mean that it's everybody knows what it is. Right. Totally. Well, the record's beautiful for anyone who likes the sound of the banjo um, and who likes just fiddle tune sounds and acoustic instruments. Um, and I do want to point out there's an awesome podcast interview with you, Nick, um, on the Picky Fingers podcast banjo podcast where you just walk through the entire record and talk about each track and the personnel and how you made it so folks who are curious should just listen to the record but also go go find that podcast and you get to hear nick really delve into the details of the album um, which is why in this interview we're not going to do that because it's already been done and it's 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 wonderful so uh, great album um as we wrap up, I do want to encourage all of you to subscribe to Nick's YouTube channel. Go to his website, see if there's an album of his or some tab you want to um, buy and support independent artistry and coffee roasters, um, <laughs> which we haven't even gotten to. Um, I realize though, we haven't talked about your banjo. Could you just tell us yeah. what banjo you're playing? It sounds beautiful. Uh, this is a, um, it's a mid thirties Gibson TB it's either a TB11 or a TB11. The different experts, which I am far from that, you know, one camp says, well, it's an 11. Another camp says, no, it's a double one. It's just like, well, okay, whatever. It's it's ones in sequence, two ones in sequence. But so uh, the pot is, uh, uh, it's got this little brass hoop on top of the rim. Um, and the neck was made by Frank Neat in... I don't know, I want to say 99, 98. I, I don't really remember. It's been on this banjo for a long time. Um, I had stainless steel frets put in you know, a couple years ago, mostly because the guy here on the island that's been working on this, on my banjos, is fixing to retire. And I was thinking, oh, there's just nobody around. I'm not going to send my banjo to Steve Huber. I mean, that's not going to happen, especially now the border's closed. But so I had stainless steel frets put in so that it'll last forever. Um, it's uh, the bridge is uh, is a custom compensated bridge made by Patrick Sauber, who plays guitar and the Jaybirds and plays banjo with Tim O'Brien and Laurie Lewis. He does a ton of session work and He's we saw we saw him playing with uh, Peter Rowan uh, at Rocky Grass. I've known Patrick for years because I I met his dad at the Swannanoa Gathering the same year I met Kirk Setfin for Old Time Week, like in 1999 or something. I'm a huge Patrick and Tom yeah. Salver fan. Yeah, those those guys are great, and Patrick is a and pa he's a he, he's a he's a great guy to travel with. He's been in the Jaybirds for three or four years. I don't, I can't remember. But he's a really great guy. I mean, he's a great guy to play music with because he's a banjo player, so he knows how to play guitar behind a banjo, which is, it's just, it. we played once, like, this is happening. There you go. Um, but he's a really great guy to travel with because he's 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 always up. Um, he, he never has, you know, a negative attitude about anything. So he's, you know, just super positive guy fun to be with great sense of humor very highly intelligent great knowledge of history and world affairs and you know because you spend a lot of time in the van just well what are we going to talk about <laughs> he's also a movie star he was the banjo player in a mighty wind yes. so that doesn't yes when he was, doesn't count for nothing he was young like in his teens i think uh, yeah yeah but yeah so so anyway so this is uh this is a bridge that 
that that he made that is custom compensated for this banjo um and i really like it i mean um one of the things that that i'm liking about this not one of the things but a, not, a few of the things that i like about this banjo is that it's really responsive um i've owned you know three or four flatheads you know tone ring banjos and i always kind of felt like i had to play them really hard to get anything out of them and i just when i got this thing and i finally got it set up the way that it wanted to be it just was there it was really resonant and wanting to talk back i mean you, i don't even hear it now but he's talking back to me right now um and especially when it's with this bridge where it's really in tune if i can get it in tune and you hit that i, I we were talking about this earlier but uh, if if i can get the banjo to be in tune with itself it just speaks so much clearer I don't know that it's louder, but it just, all the parts are working together. You know, all the notes are together and they, and they really, you know, all those subtle resonances that you don't necessarily hear, but are still there are really, really come out when it's in tune. And this, this bridge really helps that. Awesome. Well, I wonder, would you be willing to leave us with one more tune of your choosing? Yeah, sure. Let me think of one. Uh, well, here's a tune I've been working on. Um, in in uh, in one of my many journeys down the YouTube rabbit hole, I should mention is one of the other things I should mention is that I've got these uh, guitar tuners on if you can see that or not um, and these are like they're either 14 to 1 or 17 to 1 or something just super you know these are meant for guys that play speed metal and uh, for the longest time I had regular banjo pegs that were like four to one. And I would find that it was just the fine tuning was just not there. And uh, a friend of mine, this another really great banjo player named Chris Cool, plays claw hammer, lives in Toronto. Had his main banjo, I think it's his main banjo, has these kind of guitar tuners on it. And I remember just, you know, thinking about it and going, man, I, you know, I should really try that. And so I emailed Chris and he goes, Hey man, it's your banjo, you know, <laughs> do what you want. Cause there's a certain segment of the, uh, especially bluegrass, maybe old time to banjo world that it, if you do something that's outside of the, the, the norm, it's just like, you do not speak to us. <laughs> We're done with you. And this is pretty far outside of the bluegrass norm. It's just, you know, putting guitar tuners on a, it's just, it's not right. But one of the things that it does is it helps me to fine tune better. So I can be more precisely out of tune. But one of the tunes that I found in my trolling on on the on the on YouTube was this tune called Red Steer. Oh yeah, great tune. And, uh, I found this version that was done by Jack Devereaux, Raina Gellert, John Herman, and John Doyle. And uh, it's just, it's amazing. It's super powerful. I mean, you got John Doyle and John Herman. I mean, it's... <laughs> that's like all the Johns in Asheville, North Carolina right there. Yeah. Well, you know, just as another tangent, you know, we haven't talked about it, but I have a lot of favorite banjo players and John Herman is right at the top. He's just, I love his playing. He's such a cool, you know, 
and his style is so different from the way I play, but there's this, his, it's just so compelling. It's like Scruggs. It's just like, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's it right there. Yeah, but there's, there's other players that I really like as well, but so anyway, so I found this tune and it's just the way that they play it is so cool. Cause John Doyle's playing that dad, gad, Irish, Irishy kind of chord substitution stuff, which is really cool. He's such a great player. And, uh, and so I started working on, I've been working on this tune for God, five years off and on, you know, not 24 seven, but, um, just as another little funny story is it, not if it's funny or not, but a couple years ago we were at IBMA, the, the Jaybirds, and uh, Greg knows Jack. Our Greg, our Greg Spatz, our fiddle player knows Jack Devereaux, you know, pretty well, I think. And I was following Greg around these different jam rooms, and then here's here's Jack, and 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 I said to Greg, "Man, you got to introduce me to this guy. He's great." And so, hey, Jack, this is Nick. Hey, Nick, this is hey so glad to meet you you know i just i've been trying to learn your version of red steer and and he was uh he was thankful about that but that to the best of my understanding that recording was part of an album that he had planned but hasn't released yet and i remember standing there in that jam room going dude what are you doing that you got to put that out that's amazing your playing is phenomenal you got Raina geller you've got john the johns this thing is, this is like the best version of the tune I've ever heard. Anyway, so I really like that tune. And Thank you so much for doing this. Um, you've really shared so much of your time and thoughts. And I think in honor of you, we need to create a tradition here for all the interviews. <laughs> Who are your top five favorite banjo players? My top five favorite banjo players. It seems like John Herman and Earl Scruggs are maybe on that list. Absolutely. Um, so, so he asked for five. So just off to the side, off to the side, I'm going to put me. Right? Yeah. I don't want to put myself in the top five. Okay. Although you could be six. Yeah, I mean, although and and I don't want to necessarily get too philosophical about this, but I think that it is very important for people to be fans of their playing. I totally agree. And we should go on that tangent. I almost think that once you hit a certain point, like the proof that you've hit a certain point is that you've become your favorite mm, yeah. banjo player or fiddle player. Like not that you don't have heroes, but you're you're the one who can pick up an instrument in your life and make music at will. So the goal should be to become, at some point, your favorite trumpet player or singer or banjo player, I think. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, just to, to, to further tangentialize, I think that... Um, it may just be something in the West um, I, because I, I, this is the only culture I've grown up in, but there's like this, this really weird um, cultural expectation of it's a wild extreme of either you hate yourself or you are the best thing since sliced toast, sliced bread. Right. And I, I don't think that that's a very healthy way to, I don't think that's a very healthy way to go through life and especially not a healthy way to try to, do something you know artistic like play a musical instrument um I, I think that it is very good to be hypercritical of your playing i mean you look at a guy as as an example a guy like tony rice tony rice did not get to be that good of a player by just going 
Yeah, that sounds fine. What's for dinner? <laughs> oh, man, he was just, you just, I've never met Tony, but you've got to know that he was absolutely brutal in his assessment of what he was doing because you don't get to that point until you figure out all the problems with what you're playing. That's true. And, so, and just to always have a critical ear. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is good to have a critical ear, but it's also really important to not allow that self-criticism to get to the point where you just stop playing because music is like Frank Zappa said, man, music is the best. It's, and especially if you can sit down and pick up an instrument that's just sitting there and then play something that's like, wow, that sounds kind of nice. And it may be something like, it may be that. Yeah, exactly. That's if you that great. that, yeah, I and mean, it sounds. It doesn't have to be all doodly do stuff. That's you know whatever. That's that's a whole other kettle of kettle of worms. But um. So so okay so top five banjo players okay so th this may change. Earl Scruggs, John Herman, uh, Alan Mundy, Craig Smith, Alan Shelton. Um. In the next five, Bob Carlin. Um, did I say John Herman? Yeah, I said, said John Herman. Um, man, we're kind of falling off right about there. Uh, I really, I have nothing but just huge amounts of, of admiration and awe for a lot of the players up to and including guys like Bela Fleck who have elevated, um, now this is not the only thing that they've done, but who have elevated the technique of the five string banjo to such to just an incredibly high level, you know? But it's, it's kind of funny, is it a guy like Bela, he not only helped, I mean, there are other players, Jimmy Arnold and Pat Cloud and, you know, John Hickman and, other players in that sort of 70s late you know 80s kind of that were, that were raising the bar technically speaking you know even back bobby thompson and sonny osborne you know people like that right but so back to bail is it not only does the guy have like just amazing technique but he writes really great tunes and that combination of you know world-class technique and Re extremely high level songwriting ability those two things don't that's pretty rare to find those two things together in my experience yeah it's uh so you know i mean um one of the things just sort of back to the to the favorite banjo players one of the things that, that i try to do nowadays and this has been this way for many years is that i, I try to actively not listen to other players because well, a number of reasons, you know, in no particular order, I might hear something that they do and try to figure it out and realize that I can't do it and be frustrated, which I, I don't need frustration in my life. I've got enough as it is. Um, and they might write something or play something that, that I want to use or steal or, or whatever. And, 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 and I don't really want that kind of influence. I would rather listen to other styles of music and other melodic instruments just to think about melody and not so much about banjo. You know what I'm saying? I do. And it, when I listen to your playing, that makes sense. Like I can tell that you're thinking you're like, you're striving to be a unique musician and to have a voice on the banjo and not just be a copycat. And I think, you know, you have an album of all banjo instrumentals that you wrote and you don't sound like anyone else. And I feel like that's, that is a huge accomplishment and you should be really proud of that because, oh, thank you. you know, I was raised learning classical music and old time music initially. And both of those pedagogical traditions are about copying mm -hmm. other people, at least for a while. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you're allowed to start finding your voice, but it's expected. And I think painters do this too. Like you're expected to copy the masters for a long time. Mm -hmm before anyone really thinks you're going to have something to say yourself. Like, 
are you, mm-hmm. is there any way you can play the unaccompanied Bach on the violin in a way that no one has ever played? Or mm-hmm. is there a way you can play Soldier's Joy on the fiddle in a way that no one ever has? And there is, mm-hmm. but if you spend 15 years or 20 years copying other people, um, it can be hard to then craft oh, your own music, melodies and you know inflection and arrangements. And I, th- yeah. I know you listen to music because you're always learning music, but I think you're right that it can be good to um, not police, but just curate your own music intakes so that you don't turn into a mimic. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, um, something that, that uh, my brother-in-law, one of my many brother-in-laws, brothers-in-law. Yeah, it's like attorneys general. I think you pluralize the first one. Uh, said to me many years ago is that we were back when I used to drink and smoke, we were out on the porch drinking and smoking. And I was for some reason blathering on about my banjo playing. And I was complaining about the fact that whenever I picked up my banjo, a new tune was there. And my brother-in-law kind of looked at me and goes, uh, yeah, if I was you, I would, I would, I would focus on that. If that's, if, if every time you, you know, if you're finding that you're able to write, he didn't put it in this way, but you know, basically if you find that you're inspired that the muse, muse, I muse, E, whatever, uh, are making themselves available to you, then you should go for it. And that's still, I mean, thank God, knock on wood. Is it that, that still happens. I mean, I just wrote a tune this morning, just like, Oh, well, this is interesting. I don't know if it's any good or not, but it's, um, sort of, if you're dead set on being as close of a copy to your favorite player as you can be, that's not going to work. And, um, in, in the sense that you're going to shut down any possibility of, of writing something that came from you. And I, I personally think that it is really important for people to start writing as soon as they can, you know, before you've mastered the technique, because trust me, the technique, you can, there's no end to it. You can always get better at technique, but developing that, uh, that ability to write and to put stuff together. is like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I like that. I mean, you might just play it for yourself, but it's like, well, that's really cool. I like the way that sounds. I think that's important. Yeah. And I, I mean, the picture of you smoking and drinking on the porch and realizing that like, <laughs> well, with your bro- brother-in-law's help that like, you didn't have writer's block, you had writer's faucet or ho- yeah. garden hose. Yeah, That's incredible. And, it, and, um, I'm so glad that you've have followed that through and, uh, who knows, maybe we'll hear that tune you wrote this morning on your next record. <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, it's good. It's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I, I write these tunes and then I fall in love with them and I make little demo recordings of them, listen to them, listen to them. And then, you know, oh, there's another tune I'm writing. Just like, and then that one gets, that's why I have, you know, 80 tunes on phones and hard drives because I never, <laughs> anyway. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, Nick, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'll remind you again, folks, subscribe to his YouTube channel buy his records, go to Jaybird's shows when, when we're allowed to leave our houses again. Um, and if you like this sort of thing, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter of mine so that I can, I can afford to take time and, and interview master musicians like Nick and his peers and our heroes. Um, check back soon or eventually, and there'll be more interviews to come. Thanks, folks. Take care. All right. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it.